Walking for Peace, an Inner Journey by Moni Dujeji and Alberto Agrasso. Introduction. When Alberto and I began the process of writing this book, we relied heavily on our diaries. In the early versions of the script, we described every city, every person, every kilometer, every experience. The more we wrote, however, the more that we appeared to be creating an adventure travelogue, which in part it was, but one that had not captured the full spirit of our walk, or, more importantly, the driving force behind all of these experiences. It was at this stage that I balked. I preferred to speak about the places and the people, and keep the full extent of what was happening within me to myself. My deepest fears, curiously the same ones that I walked into Jerusalem with, now played out on a grander scale. What would people say if I revealed my insecurities and my judgments, if I told them what I was really thinking? And if I told them that the biggest decisions of my life I made by following signs and omens, that I didn't necessarily think through each situation, but merely jumped in and winged it, trusting that the universe would guide me through it. Would people, especially those I hold dear, think I was crazy? If I mentioned I was on a spiritual journey, a quest to know myself, would they think I had become a religious fanatic? The more I thought about it, the more vulnerable I felt. So I resisted. The forces of the universe, however, were relentless and kept tugging at me to speak from my heart, to have courage to speak about my inner journey. But I wasn't prepared. I fought with them, with myself, and especially with Alberto. With each story we would write, he would try to reason with me, to explain, cajole, anything, to get me to write about what was happening behind the veil, as he often referred to it. When I eventually did, I saw the beauty of the experience from a perspective I hadn't considered before. It was in those moments, when I let go, that I felt especially inspired, perhaps guided, and when the words seemed to flow through me like a current. I eventually stopped resisting, put aside my fears, and allowed that flow to continue. The people in the events that you are about to hear are all true. In certain situations, we changed the names when we felt we needed to tell the story to demonstrate an important point in our journey, but we didn't want to unintentionally offend the individuals involved. We also had to remove a great number of stories, and although they are not yet available, you can still visit our website, walkingforpeace.com, to see our exact route, day by day, along with some photos, some anecdotes, and interviews that we granted along the way. You can also find that information on Instagram by following Walking for Peace and on Facebook by following either Moni Dojeji or Alberto Agrasso. Having two people come to agreement on every aspect of one book has not been an easy task. In many ways, it too was a journey. This may not be the book I would have written alone or that Alberto would have written alone, but this final product has exceeded our wildest expectations. It is an entirely new creation, not a compromise of creations. Nothing has been lost. On the contrary, both visions have expanded. Perhaps this book, in some small measure, can stand as an example of what can be accomplished when the intention is to unite and transcend differing views rather than keep them separated. Perhaps this can show a path towards peace that is lasting. We live in moments of great change, where our consciousness of peace is emerging and taking form. In this nascent state, it is still fragile and easy to dismiss as utopian. But all great journeys begin with a single step. And no matter how tentative these first steps may seem, they all inevitably lead to their destination, one that may even surprise us. 
I invite you to take that first step with me now. Prologue. I would love for you to join me on my walk for peace to Jerusalem, I enthused. What? I'm still recovering from the Camino de Santiago, Hannah joked. The candlelight flickered, accentuating the warmth of that already unforgettable evening. I had arrived in Bonn, Germany that very afternoon and stepped into the welcoming arms of my pilgrim friends, Hannah and Alberto, with whom I now shared a wonderful meal. My imminent departure on my pilgrimage for peace, along with their budding romance and future plans, gave us great cause to celebrate. You know, I appreciate you asking, Hannah added, but I just started a new job and I can't leave so quickly. I looked over at Alberto and said, well, if you're interested, you're welcome to join me. Alberto stared at me, looking visibly shaken. The moment passed and the conversation continued well into the late hours of the evening. But Alberto seemed sad when we said our goodnights. I awakened the next morning to find an anxious looking couple wanting to speak with me. Hannah's eyes were red and swollen. Last night, when you asked us to, she started to speak but then buried her face in her hands and began to weep. Alberto placed his arms around her shoulders and looked at me gravely. I believe that I must walk with you, he said. Oh, I replied, well, that's great, right? I can't go. Hannah said through her tears, I've just come back from a year's sabbatical. I waited for the explanation that was causing so much grief. Moni, Alberto finally said, since arriving in Germany, I have been receiving signs, synchronicities, telling me that something important was about to happen, a big jump in my inner journey. When you arrived yesterday, the signs intensified and pointed clearly for me to go with you to Jerusalem. Hannah continued sobbing, shaking her head, no. Alberto looked at her with concern. I'm happy here with Hannah and I'm excited about our plans to build a future together, he said. But last night, the signs were constant. I tried to ignore them and to convince myself that they were nothing more than my unconscious desire for adventure, but they kept coming. I finally decided that I would consider the possibility of walking with you if you asked me directly. And last night, you did. Yeah, but I stammered, I, I only meant for you to walk a couple of weeks with me, not the whole way. Still. Alberto persisted, my sign was very clear. And what about all our plans? Hannah spat out. What will happen now? How long will you be gone? I can't wait for you. I need you here. And what if you hear about another pilgrimage two years from now? Are you just going to go every time you receive strong signs? I can't live like that. I need to know that you will be here. I still haven't made my final decision, Alberto replied. Besides, I can't give you that kind of guarantee. No one can. His eyes searched hers for understanding. And he said, you can come too, you know. What do you want me to do? She retorted. Quit my job and not think about my future? Where will the money come from? What will we do when we come back? We would need to start from zero all over again. But Hannah, you hate your job, Alberto persisted. How many times have we said that when we follow a dream or a call, all that we need comes to us? It's not some nice idea from a fairy tale. It's true. I've lived it and you've lived it. A heavy silence hung in the air. I didn't know what to say or do, and so sat quietly hoping for some quick end to this agony. 
I'm turning 40, Alberto finally, finally said. I want to start a family. I want a man waiting for me when I come home. I don't think it's too much to ask for. I understand, Alberto responded. I'm only trying to live what I believe. Hannah looked at him sadly and said, I don't feel any attraction for Jerusalem. It's not my calling. Hannah and Alberto continued speaking in Spanish, and so I left them to get some fresh air. I had expected to walk to Jerusalem alone and didn't know how I felt about having company. Alberto seemed likable enough, but I knew little about him. We had only spent a few days together and always with Hannah, who acted as our translator when my sparse Spanish and his high school English failed us. How would we communicate without her? We seemed to hold similar views about peace, but he didn't appear interested in peace in Jerusalem. I didn't know what other differences were waiting to reveal themselves or if I wanted to find out. This was my walk and I wanted to do it my way. As I breathed the night air, my runaway thoughts began to slow and the whispers of my intuition to become less faint. These events were no coincidence. I knew we were all being brought together in a web of circumstances whose purpose I didn't understand, much less control, no matter how desperately I wished to do so. I needed to trust and to allow whatever was happening to unfold. Determined to do exactly that, or at least try, I returned to find Alberto waiting for me. I'm going with you, he announced. I only need a few days to prepare. I'm leaving for Rome tomorrow, I responded, and I will meet you when you're ready. I have something to show you, Alberto said, holding out his hand. In it was a silver pendant of an eagle. This used to be my totem. I think it will bring you luck for the way. I took the pendant trying to contain my astonishment. In that moment, I understood that my meeting Alberto was fated and that we indeed had a journey to make together.